Hello, everyone. Welcome to a Facebook Live presentation with me, David A. Kelly. You may know me as the author of some Ballpark Mysteries books, and uh, I'm here tonight to take you on a little tour of Rickwood Field in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, there's actually going to be a very big Major League Baseball game there in a couple of days on Thursday night between the San Francisco Giants and the St. Louis Cardinals. And I think it'll be the first Major League Baseball game played in the state of Alabama. So it's pretty historic and it's kind of interesting. They're playing at a minor league stadium called Rickwood Field, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about later on. And uh, the, the uh, game is a tribute to the Negro Leagues, which we're also going to talk about, and all the great Negro League players that actually went through Rickwood Field over the years. So thanks for joining me. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Rickwood Field, and I'm going to do a little reading from my latest book, Ballpark Mysteries, number 20, Satchel Stolen Strike. And then I'll take questions. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please just put them into the chat and hopefully we'll get to them at the end if we have time. And again, thank you for joining me. And uh, let's dig right in. So I'm here to talk a little bit about Satchel's Stolen Strike, which is the latest ballpark mysteries book. And again, it takes place in Rickwood Field in Birmingham, Alabama, where Major League Baseball is going to have their big game on Thursday. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to kind of take a tour of the stadium based upon uh, the tour that I did last September when I started researching this book. And one of the things that I do when I start writing books before I start writing is actually taking a research trip to whatever team or stadium I'm writing about. And I look for interesting things that can help me create a mystery or come up with clues or settings or characters for the book or the mystery that I'm writing. So I did that last September at Rickwood Field, had a chance to see the stadium, see the field, um, look into the museum, kind of explore the city of Birmingham as well, and uh, came back with a lot of information and proceeded to write the book Satchel Stolen Strike. So let me dig right in actually and uh, jump into the presentation. Here we go, here we go. So um, again, thank you for joining me. And if you have any questions, want more details on this book or any of my other ballpark mystery books, you can uh, visit me at www.davidakellybooks.com. And, uh, Again, I started writing the Ballpark Mysteries because I thought what I had was a pretty good idea. Um, why not put a mystery in different major league ballparks? Turns out there's 30 major league uh, teams, and you should see the map there in front of you. And all those teams and stadiums and cities are really different. So that actually uh, turned out to be a really good idea because it allows me to come up with really different mysteries for each team I write about. And so it's kind of fun as I research books, I'm looking for something interesting, different or unique that I can kind of create a mystery around. So that's how I came up with the idea for the Ballpark Mysteries books. There are actually 24 books in this series. These are ideal for kids in elementary school, um, ideal for kind of grades uh, two and three, but I've got readers as young as kindergarten and as old as fifth or sixth grade. Each of the books has a, a chapter of nonfiction information at the back of the book. Uh, so you get to learn about the team or the stadium or the city. And there are 19 <clears throat> um, team books in the series so far. You know, there's 30 baseball teams. I've covered 19 of them in the books. I have 11 more to go. And then there are also some super specials that take place in special locations, such as the World Series um, or the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, or a New York City Subway Series book or even a Little League World Series that takes place in uh, Williamsport, Pennsylvania. So those are kind of extra special mysteries. But again, we're here to kind of talk about Birmingham, Alabama, and Brickwood Field tonight. And you might wonder, if I'm writing about major league teams, why did I decide to, decide to write about Birmingham, Alabama, and Brickwood Field? Um, pretty much because of what's happening on Thursday. So again, on Thursday, I think it's about 7.15 p.m. Eastern time. It's going to be the start of the game, or the game probably starts at, at uh, 7.30 p.m. Uh, it's going to be broadcast on Fox, I believe, and, and perhaps on some streaming uh, services if you pay for them, like FUBU. But um, Major League Baseball is holding kind of like a Field of Dreams game at Rickwood Field uh, in honor of Juneteenth and as a tribute to the Negro Leagues and all the great Negro League players um, that uh, you know about, like Satchel Page and Willie Mays. So the teams playing are going to be the San Francisco Giants versus the St. Louis Cardinals. 
both of which I actually have books about. I have the San Francisco Splash as well as the Cardinals Caper. Both of these are fun books, and some of the characters from these books actually come back into the new book, Satchel's Stolen Strike. Now, another reason to write about Rickwood Field is it's actually America's oldest ballpark. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this later, too, but it opened in August 1910. That's two years before Fenway Park, which is the oldest major league ballpark. So it's kind of an incredible piece of history and kind of a very interesting place to visit. Now, as I said before, when I start a new book, I start by doing research. So I research, of course, right here at my desk. I look through books and the internet. I go to the library, but then I love to take a research trip, again, to whatever team or stadium I'm writing about and spend some time to get to know it. So just to set the um, kind of context here, uh, Birmingham is in Alabama. Alabama is in the middle of the Southern United States. It's kind of up into the left of Florida. It's right to the left of Georgia. Um, it's right above Louisiana, below Tennessee. So I've circled it with a green, red, uh, green, big green circle there. And Birmingham is kind of in the middle of the state. And I actually had a great trip there. It was uh, very beautiful, some really nice country, much um, kind of more hilly than I would have thought. Uh, for some reason, I perhaps pictured something flatter, um, but it's not flat. It's a beautiful country down there. And um, within Birmingham, uh, I have the city, kind of the downtown area of Birmingham circled on the map that you should be seeing. And um, just to set the context, Rickwood Field is basically um, a few miles west of Birmingham, downtown Birmingham. Now, Birmingham uh, these days does have a new minor league um, stadium that's in the downtown area. So um, Rickwood Field is now used by school groups and some college groups and some other special teams and special locations. But it's, um, it's not a regular uh, minor league uh, location anymore. But it's about 10 minutes away from downtown Birmingham. And here's just a couple of quick shots of the stadium so you get some context. This is kind of looking from up uh, in, in near the press box, kind of behind home plate. And it's got a really nice feel to it. It's very um, kind of old timey, but it's also got uh, just a pure baseball feel. Here's the outside from the front. Um, that's what you'd be looking if you came into the, the front area of the stadium. And then some quick stats on it. Um, so the capacity is around 10,000. I think that's about the number they're expecting for um, Thursday night's major league game. Uh, they have done some new construction uh, at the stadium. We'll touch upon that shortly. And as I mentioned, the stadium opened in August of 1910. That's quite a while ago, two years before Fenway Park opened and four years before Wrigley Field opened. So it really does have a pedigree and a history. Um, it was owned and created by Alan Harvey Rick Woodward, who was the chairman of the Woodward Iron Company. So he had some money and he had a lot of, had a lot of local connections. Uh, he had bought the team in 1909 and invested pretty quickly in building this new stadium. It was completed within the year and it was actually the first concrete and steel stadium uh, in the minor league. So he didn't scrimp when it came to investing in the team and he kind of modeled it on Scheib Park in Philadelphia and Forbes Field in Pittsburgh. So it definitely has this kind of uh, very retro feel and a, and a nice feel when you're there. So as I mentioned, Thursday night's game is coming up in a couple of days. Tonight, they're actually holding a minor league game there. And then tomorrow, they're having some uh, a barnstorming event, uh, which is kind of a entertainment as well as, I think, a softball game going on. So they're really kind of going all in and creating a bunch of activities and special nights at Brookwood Field, which culminate on Thursday with the major league game. And these are some of the things I found last year, the September when I was there. Uh, some of the changes that MLB is making to the stadium. So here's an aerial rendering of what they envision the stadium is going to look like in a couple of days. Um, you can see they've created an outdoor pavilion area across the road. They've upgraded the lighting. They've upgraded the field. They've also uh, upgraded the dugouts. We'll see that in a little bit. And I'm sure added a bunch of other things. So here's their view of the field. Uh, it didn't quite look like that, although it does look nice when you're there. Uh, they've upgraded the dugouts to make them um, meet MLB standards. Uh, of course, they were built in 1910, so they don't necessarily do that. And they've created this outdoor area 
uh, for fans uh, before they're entering the, uh, the stadium. So going back into history a little bit, Rickwood Field was home to the Birmingham Barons and the Birmingham Black Barons. So the Birmingham Barons were the minor league white team and the Birmingham Black Barons were the uh, Negro League's black team. And you might notice that both of those teams have something in common. They have the word Barons in common. And you might wonder why they called themselves the Barons. Because of coal, coal barons, the people that made all the money in the coal fields, the coal barons. And you might wonder, what does coal have to do with Alabama? Well, it turns out quite a lot. They have a lot of coal mines down there at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. Um, there were coal mines kind of all through the middle of the state. So in this map that you see, um, those yellow areas are all coal fields where they did mining for coal. And Birmingham is kind of right in the middle there, kind of near that green star in Jefferson County. And um, so there were a lot of coal mines and there were a lot of people that had made money off of coal in one way or another, including Rick Woodward. And um, that's why they named themselves the Barons. So you can actually travel to Birmingham today and see a coal mine. So I took a selfie outside um, one of the coal mines um, in the center, basically in the center of the city on one of the hills near the Vulcan statue, which is also a pretty cool thing to see. And uh, this was the Lone Pine Mine. It was active in the early 1900s. This is, you can't go any farther than this. They've set up this little um, entrance way to give you a, some perspective of what it might've looked like back then. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I didn't expect that. And that was one of the things that I was hoping to kind of actually include in my story, but it just didn't fit when I got down to the writing part. The other thing we're gonna talk about is Negro Leagues. Um, and um, the Birmingham Black Barons were part of the Negro Southern League. Uh, and as I'll tell you shortly, there were different Negro Leagues throughout the country. Um, the Negro Leagues actually started in the 1920s, but before that, uh, black baseball players, um, originally some of them did play on major league teams, but by the end of the 1800s, because of racial discrimination, they were basically excluded and started forming their own baseball teams. Um, they started barnstorming to play other teams, whoever would play them, whether it was black teams or white teams. And then in the 1920s, the first Negro League, the Negro National League, was formed in Kansas City. And that's actually where the um, Negro uh, League's museum is. That's a wonderful place to visit, as is the Negro Southern League Museum in Birmingham. Uh, and then soon after, other leagues followed from the Negro, the Negro Southern League, the East-West League, the American Negro League, and the Eastern Color. There were multiple Negro Leagues that existed in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Um, and that was until about 1947, <clears throat> when Jackie Robinson was signed uh, to the Dodgers, things started to change. That was kind of a seismic event in terms of the Negro Leagues. Um, during the 1950s, a transition started to occur relatively quickly where good players started leaving the Negro Leagues and migrating to major league teams unless they were too old or couldn't sign with a team. Um, and then by the 1960s, things were in a pretty steep decline in terms of the Negro Leagues. Most of the good or all the good players had left. Um, the last Negro Leagues All-Star Game occurred in 1962. And that's about the time that the Baron, Black Barons played their last game. And then the last barnstorming Negro Leagues team, the Indianapolis Clowns, uh, they played into the 80s. But that was really more of a pure entertainment type situation. Now, the Birmingham Black Barons had some great players, including Satchel Paige and Willie Mays. Uh, and here's a photograph of Willie Mays on the 1948 uh, Negro League pennant winning team. Uh, he was just 17. It was the first team he played for. Uh, it's kind of he played there for just a short time and then moved on. But um, that's some great history that they have. And then what I thought I would do is actually take you on the tour of Rickwood that I found when I went there to, to research the book. As I mentioned before, uh, this is right behind uh, the backstop uh, home plate. Um, it opened two years before Fenway Park. So it is America's oldest ballpark, professional ballpark. And you get that feeling when you walk in the entranceways. Here's the kind of old timey entrance gates that you would be walking through if you went to, went to Rickwood Field. 
uh, passing the old-timey refreshment stand, which hopefully has been upgraded for the uh, Major League game coming on Thursday. And uh, there's their lineup uh, cards for the night on the blackboard. So it's a very uh, kind of uh, retro feel um, if you're going to the ballpark. In terms of the field, uh, once you walk out onto the seating area, there's a section, a, a walkway that goes around all the seating area. Uh, and it's, it's pretty nice. You've got just a nice pathway and great views of the field. Um, there's the home plate and down the side. The day I was there, there was um, a couple of um, travel teams there. Um, these are probably middle grade uh, travel teams or young high school, and they were having a great time playing in this minor league stadium that makes you feel like you're in a major league stadium. And it was really great. Here are some other uh, pictures from that day. Uh, not a lot of fans there. There were some parents, so you can see them just over in the right. And uh, those are the dugouts that will have been upgraded by Major League. Uh, and there's a nice view of the whole field itself. So um, looking from the outfield, you've got these really iconic uh, light poles, the four uh, overhanging uh, light um, stands that are kind of neat. Those were installed uh, well after opening. I don't have the specific date. I think it's in the 30s or 40s. Uh, so later on um, to attract uh, more attendance at, at games. And here are the stands. You've got some seats up front and then you've got a lot of bleachers, uh, which makes sense given the minor league nature. And we're looking down the first baseline. And if you look at the back of this photo on the left, I'm going to circle it for you. You see something circle? That's the segregated seating. So if you went to a Birmingham Barons game, the area that I've circled is where the black uh, fans would sit. However, if you went to a Birmingham Black Barons game, the area that I circled is where the white people would sit. So um, again, back in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, uh, white and black people were not allowed to sit together at an event like this uh, because of Jim Crow laws and segregation. So here's a picture of those segregated seats just looking straight at them. It's the two sections kind of at the end of the first baseline and there's the view from the seating the segregated seating up back to the field. So not the best seats in the house. Um, here's a press box. So directly behind home plate is a press box under the roof. Uh, very old timey look and feel right there. Uh, I don't know how they're gonna handle it for Thursday night's game because I imagine they have more press than that there. Um, they've got a nice scoreboard, uh, very old fashioned kind of wood scoreboard along with the uh, wood outfield signs, which are really great. Uh, again, I think they've replaced those or basically put something in front of them for the major league game. So that'll be probably a little bit different if you watch it on TV. And then as I'm researching the books, I'm, um, I'm looking for um, all the information I can find about the stadium. I'm looking for anything different, anything unique and interesting settings for my characters that might play a part in the mystery. So there are a couple of passageways under the seats on both sides of home plate. Um, I just checked them out. This is just a, basically a walkway and you can see there's some um, field equipment. There's a chalk cart there under, the, um, under that doorway. Uh, there's a couple of rakes and a ladder. So I'm looking for these as possible locations for my characters within the book. So when I um, visit a ballpark, I'm taking as many pictures as I can. Here's the locker room. Uh, not um, not major league quality for sure. Um, maybe not bad. Uh, probably like something you'd see in the movie Bull Durham. And again, I think they've probably updated this for the major league game, but it's kind of a basic bare bones, traditional uh, minor league locker room. The light towers, I just wanted to show an extra picture of those. I think they're very iconic and kind of cool looking. So those are those are kind of great. And uh, here's a shot of Rick Wood's original press box, which actually was located above home plate to behind home plate on top of the roof. It was a gazebo that held up the four people. Um, and it was kind of cool. Eventually, sometime uh, during its lifetime, it was taken down, but it was also rebuilt in 1998. Um, and you can also see other people up on the roof. So during some of the games, like um, they used to have Rick Wood classics uh, there on an annual basis. That was a special kind of retro uh, minor league game that they would play there. And um, they would allow some people up on the roof for that. So um, I definitely thought about that when I was writing the book. I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute.
And another interesting thing about Rickwood, which I don't know if you'll be able to see if you follow the game on Thursday, but they've actually moved the outfield, um, the right wall in. So it used to be deeper. And so in this photograph I have, I've circled, um, there's an old concrete wall that's at the top of the picture where the green arrows are basically. Um, they actually moved it in about 30 feet, I think. Um, and you can see in the yellow arrow, that's actually the wood walls that I showed you previously just at the end of the stands. So um, here's another picture of that. You can see they've actually parked cars out in the, what used to be the outfield against that concrete wall. And now what is there is the inner wood wall. It's definitely um, about actually about 50 feet shorter in that location that you see right there, 448 feet versus 393. That's a pretty big difference. Now, Rickwood, again, when I went there uh, on the weekend, um, they also have a, a little museum. Uh, and, and a store, um, and it's a volunteer-run museum that has some exhibits of things like the Birmingham Black Barons uniforms and the Barons uniforms and some information on different players, and it's nicely done. You're not going to spend a whole lot of time there, but it's definitely worth taking a look at and spending some time with, um, and it turns out that Ripley Field has also been the location for a bunch of movies and some TV shows because it does have that great old-time um, you know, kind of pure baseball feel. So one of them that was filmed there was uh, the movie 42, which is featured the life story of Jackie Robinson. So they actually have the movie locker. This was a prop locker that was created for the movie or for some scenes in the movie, uh, along with some of the other props that they used in the movie um, that relate to that Jackie Robinson 42 movie. So that was kind of fun. And then in addition to the museum, when I'm researching these books, I also look around the city and I didn't include too many shots of the city in this presentation. But, you know, one of the places I went to was Dreamland Barbecue. This is uh, in Birmingham. And I did want to try to feature the food or include the food. And unfortunately, this location didn't specifically make it into Satchel Stolen Strike. Uh, it is referenced in here, not by name but my characters are heading towards uh, a barbecue restaurant when they're interrupted in the story by part of the mystery. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, move my characters outside the ballpark in this book, but I certainly do the research. Um, you have to sit down and try things too. That's one of the good things about writing a ballpark mystery book. So that's a quick overview and tour of Rickwood Field. And then what I thought I would do next is tell you a little bit about Satchel's Stolen Strike. And um, it starts with this guy. So here's a picture of Satchel Page, and he is one of the best uh, pitchers of all time. And as, as you'll see the quote on the next slide, if he's not the best pitcher, he's perhaps the most colorful pitcher. Um, and him kissing this baseball is actually perfect because um, the mystery in this book uh, comes down to a Satchel Page baseball that gets stolen. So um, I thought Satchel was a great character to base here in uh, Rickwood Field because he actually played for the Birmingham Black Barons for three years, in addition to playing for a bunch of other uh, Negro League teams. So he played in 27, 28, and 29. And he went on to play for other Negro League teams and then eventually played in the majors uh, for a while. And uh, as, this, uh, as this back of this card says, if Page wasn't the best pitcher in baseball history, he might have been the most colorful. And one of the reasons he was most colorful is that he really played to the crowd, and he also loved to name his pitches. So here's just some of the pitches that Satchel Page says he threw um, and showing him in the windup for I think that's his cannonball pitch um, is what you're seeing there. But he played, uh, he threw bloopers, loopers, droppers, jump balls, b-balls, um, screw balls, wobbly balls, whipsy dipsy do balls, hurry up balls, nutting balls, bat dodgers, and cannonballs. Um, so I like those names. I include those in the book, uh, in, in, in the book here when Mike and Kate are talking about Satchel Page. It was fun to include him as a character. Now, um, when I'm writing these books, I am looking for a mystery. So I had some really cool locations after I did the research, but then I have to come up with a mystery. And I thought, let's pick a player like Satchel Page, and then how can I make a connection to um, the current game and what's going on and why my characters, Mike and Kate, are there? And I came up with the idea of a Satchel Page baseball 
um, that basically gets stolen. And that's the mystery in this book. And my characters, Mike, Kate, and this other character, their friend, Andy, who was actually in my Kansas City Royals book, um, The All-Star Joker, he comes back to actually help Mike and Kate solve this mystery. Um, and what I thought I would do is actually just read a couple of pages of this book to you so you get a feel for Satchel's Stolen Strike and my characters, Mike and Kate, before I tell you a little bit more about how the book gets made. So the first uh, chapter is called Touching History at Rickwood. And uh, here's the opening image. You can kind of see it there. My characters, Mike and Kate, are at Rickwood Field. They're down on the infield and they have, um, I don't know if you can see that, but they have a baseball. Kate has a baseball in her hands. And that baseball is a Satchel Page baseball. So I'm just going to read a couple of pages. Touching history at Rickwood. Satchel Page, Kate Hopkins asked as she rolled a dirty old baseball from hand to hand. <clears throat> this ball was used by one of the best pitchers of all time. Indeed, said the tall woman standing next to her. She wore a blue polo shirt with the Rickwood Field logo. The name Leah was written below. Satchel threw it for a final strikeout in an important game for the Birmingham Black Barons. They were a Negro Leagues team based right here at Rickwood Field in Birmingham, Alabama. Major League Baseball will give away that ball after tomorrow's game celebrating Juneteenth. And I'm going to win it, Kate's cousin Mike Walsh says. Mike pulled a baseball out of his pants pocket. He liked to carry one wherever he went. He never knew when a game of catch would break out. Mike stepped back, wound up, and prepared printed to throw a pitch with a ball. Pow, strike three. As Satchel might say, that was a winning ball pitch. Just like my entries in a big contest, he said, I entered Satchel's strikeout sweepstakes over a hundred times in the past month. It was just after 11 o'clock in the morning, Mike and Kate were standing near home plate at Rickwood Field. Most people don't know it, but Rickwood Field is the oldest professional baseball park in the country, Leah went on. It was home to both the Birmingham Barons and the Birmingham Black Barons. The Barons were a minor league team with white players, and the Black Barons were a Negro Leagues team with black players. Leah crouched down. She picked up a handful of rusty brown dirt from the baseline path. In fact, 182 future Hall of Famers played right here, including some of the biggest stars of the Negro Leagues. She said, hold out your hands. Mike and Kate held their hands out. Leah raised the dirt over their hands and then spread her fingers. Clumps of infield dirt rained down over Mike and Kate's outstretched palms. Hey, what are you doing, Kate asked. Leah laughed. Our infield dirt is famous, she said. Over the years, it's been blessed with the spit of over 180 baseball Hall of Famers. Now you're part of it too. Yuck, Kate said, wiping her fingers on her shorts. Cool, Mike said. He held up his hand to look at his dusty fingers. Then he leaned to the side and spat into the dirt. Does that mean I'll be a Hall of Famer now, he asked. Leah smiled. Well, I guess we'll have to see about that, she said. But you're definitely a part of Rickwood Field now. And I can't read any more from that chapter to you, but um, soon after that ball that Kate is holding in her hands gets stolen, and that becomes the mystery for this book. And I do, in fact, have some Rickwood Field dirt here. There is a jar of the Rickwood Field dirt with a spit of over 100 or 182 uh, future Hall of Famers in it. So that's kind of a neat uh, little souvenir that you can get if you go to Rickwood Field. Now, when I before I started writing the book, I did the research. I collect a lot of interesting information, and I try to come up with that story. I came up with a mystery idea of a missing Satchel Page baseball, and I write the story. And then the second half of the process actually has to do with my illustrator, Mark Mayers. He needs to illustrate, at least provide one or two illustrations for each chapter based upon the work I'm doing. So it's kind of interesting to see how some of his illustrations match up with what I found uh, when I went to the park. So we'll talk a little bit about illustrating Satchel's stolen strike. So here's the opening uh, illustration that I showed you. Mike and Kate are on the field, and there's a picture of the field. The, Mike, uh, Mark did a great job. Um, it doesn't really line up one-to-one, -one, but you get a feel with those um, signboards in the background behind Mike and Kate and the baseball diamond, and it's a, a good way to open the book. Now, I showed you the passageway picture earlier, so here's how the passageway actually ended up in the book and kind of in the middle of the chapter. Mike and Kate are investigating that line chalking cart that you see right there in that passageway. 
um, and they're going to be menaced by someone. You can see a shadow coming down um, the hallway, and we don't quite know who that is, and I'm not going to tell you, but I think Mark did a great job kind of uh, representing that passageway, as well as giving good visual into Mike and Kate and what might be happening. And here's their friend Andy, uh, who they meet up with, and he helps them solve the mystery. And he actually comes from the All-Star Joker. I think that's book number five um, in uh, the Ballpark Mystery Series. And Andy, in this scene, is actually pointing at the segregated seats. Those are the seats that I showed you a few uh, minutes ago at the end of the first base uh, foul line. Uh, that's where the blacks had to sit during white games or the whites had to sit during black games. And... Um, Andy is explaining uh, those segregated seats. And here on the right is that photo that I showed you previously. And you can kind of see those in the background. So interesting to see how that ended up in the book. Uh, here is the Rickwood Field Museum. And it's not really a picture of the whole room, but you get an idea of some of the display cases that I saw. They have uh, specialized bats and photos of players that have played there. And then the, the illustration on the left is my character, Mike, who has just basically run into um, a baseball expert, uh, Elijah Montgomery, Dr. Elijah Montgomery, uh, there. And uh, he's getting a hand up from the ground because he bumped into him and fell over. But the museum also features in the mystery. And then lastly, uh, the, the book ends actually with my characters up on the roof. And I did show you pictures of people up on the roof of Rickwood Field. And it was just such a great visual and such a great idea. I mean, if I was a kid, I would love to go up on the roof of this place. And they get to have their dinner, their hot dogs up there, just as the sun is going down the night before the big major league game. And it's a really beautiful setting to conclude the book in. And on the right, you can see a couple of shots of, from other people of what it looks like up on the roof. So it was really fun to include that roof scene in the book. Then in terms of kind of writing the story, kind of skipped ahead to the illustrations, but when I'm writing a ballpark mysteries book, it kind of looks like this at my desk. Uh, I've got some, well, you know, I've got Microsoft Word on the computer. I've got some pages and some notes in front of me, and I've got a lot of stickies with ideas that I have about things that might work or might not work. And there are different things that I have to do. So I, I do take all the information from the research trip, the time I spent at Rickwood Field. I kind of write down a list of what I thought was either interesting, either from a location perspective or from just a visual perspective or from a history perspective. And then I try to combine it with a list of mystery ideas I have. So it turns out there's a lot of different ways you can write a mystery story. You can write a mystery story about something stolen or missing the way I do here. Um, satchel's uh, baseball gets stolen but you can also write a mystery story where there might be ghosts or something supernatural or where somebody is being threatened or where there's a case of mistaken identity or where something is counterfeit so there's a lot of different ways you can create a mystery story and i kind of try to find one that's going to fit uh, the details that i have relating to that specific team uh, i try to add in some clues and red herrings you, you, you want to have real clues that will help the detectives and the reader solve the mystery and you want to have some red herrings that are going to kind of throw people off the scent and then of course you have to have the characters actually solving the mystery and this has to be a very proactive thing they can't just kind of happen upon the solution by luck or by chance they have to use deduction and reasoning and um, they have to take some actions to investigate and learn what might have happened uh, to actually have them solve the mystery. So it's actually a very active process. Um, and of course, once they figure out what happened, that's not the end of the story because then they have to catch the criminal. So usually there's a couple of chapters at the end where you're kind of catching the criminal and then you're kind of wrapping up and resolving the story. So that's kind of the writing process that I go through. Um, it's usually takes a, about a month or a month and a half to do that. I start out with an outline and then I write it. And uh, when I when I get ready to hand it in to my editor, it looks nice and clean and she'll read it for about a month and then send it back to me. And it will usually come back to me with like 30 changes for each page. And I'll have like 50 or 60 pages. So even though I've published over 30 books, I will have hundreds of changes um, every time I write a new one because there's lots of ways to improve the writing, um, streamline things. But luckily, sometimes. The changes are kind of easy, like on this page, she's just flipping the order of some words, she's deleting some words, she's moving some sentences down below, she's asking me questions. So I will go through, I'll make all these changes, I'll make the easy ones first, and I'll save the harder ones for later. Um, we'll go through and make all the changes, I'll send it back to her, 
then she, my editor will send it back to me with more changes. And we go through this process about three or four times. There's lots and lots of revision that it takes to make one of these books. And um, then there's lots of revision actually in the illustration process too, because you have to kind of come up with sketch ideas. You have to sketch them. You have to make some adjustments based upon where it sits in the book. And then you have to have the final illustrations. And usually there's some tweaks to those. So that's really the process. And um, before I see if there's any questions, I'm just going to give you a very quick sneak peek of the next Mike and Kate book. There's actually a new uh, series starting called the Mike and Kate Mysteries that has my two main characters, but it's not specifically tied to one sport like football or baseball. I have a football mysteries and a, ba a ballpark mystery series. The new one is actually just called the Mike and Kate Mysteries, and it's starting out with something very different. It's going to be a monster mystery, in this case, a zombie mystery called the Zillion Zombie Heist. And you can see Mike and Kate on the cover of this book. Um, that's not a final cover, but it is a somewhat final cover. So there will be some changes to it, but it's kind of a fun um, zombie mystery book coming up sometime later this summer, possibly in July more likely in August. So uh, tune in for that. And then there will also be more um, ballpark mysteries. There may be another Rickwood Field mystery coming out later this year, maybe a Willie Mays mystery. So check back in with me on that. And at this point, I'm going to see if we have any questions um, just to see what's going on here. If you do have any questions, uh, please ask them. Please put them into the chat. I would be happy to ask, uh, to answer any questions. Um, I think one of the things that surprised me, uh, the first question here is what surprised me about Rickwood Field. And I, I think it just felt so much like a kind of a, a pure baseball experience. It was just the field, the seats, the stands. It just felt like baseball. And sometimes when you go into the big um, major league stadiums, I've got so much going on these days. And I like most of them. Uh, but there's kids areas and special restaurants and special bars and special seating areas. The focus was just so much on the baseball that it really felt like a pure baseball experience. And I really liked that. That was kind of interesting, even though I didn't see a game there. Uh, but it'll be very interesting to see how this major league game uh, gets played there. So that was one of the cool things about that. Then let's see, the next question that I'm getting here is, um, how do I decide upon the mystery? So I explained a little bit about mystery and I, I can do a combination of um, the information I find, like what locations I can have my characters go to, as well as um, the different types of mystery ideas that I talked about. So for this situation, again, it just felt very specific. When you have something stolen, it intrinsically kind of has a value. So it's, 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 um, it's good to create motivation and um, my readers can get their heads around it. They can really kind of understand something being stolen. Um, so it's a very direct type of mystery. So that was kind of fun. And I picked Satchel Page just because there's a lot of great um, Negro Leagues players that I could have picked. And again, there may be one about Willie Mays because I've got a really good idea of something that might involve him for the next Rickwood Field mystery. Um, but I and I loved Satchel Page's connection to the Birmingham Black Barons. He played there uh, for two or three years and just his kind of entertaining um, per persona was really great with those different uh, baseball names uh, for the pitches. That was kind of fun to work with. So that is the second question. And if anybody else has questions, feel free to uh, ask. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Yep. Okay. And that's not it. So um, I think that's it. We don't have any other questions. Um, I would be, you can always go to my website, davidakellybooks.com. Uh, and you can email me or contact me through the form. And it's been great sharing Rickwood Field with you. I hope you all tune in on Thursday for a Major League at Rickwood Field game. That's going to be kind of fun. And if you happen to be there, I am going to be there. Uh, reach out to me. Let me know. I'd be happy to say hi or um, hook you up with a signed book if you're interested. And then keep your eyes out for the Monster Mystery book and perhaps another Rickwood book and another a football mystery book, hopefully coming out before the end of the year. So lots of stuff happening with my characters, Mike and Kate, and the ballpark mysteries. And until then, yeah, until you get to see those books, uh, keep reading, and we'll see you at the ballpark. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.